Okay, I have a question for you. We've been looking at stepping out. We've been looking at healing. We've been looking at faith. So let me ask the question. Did Jesus heal every sick person who came to him? Yes, he did. Everyone that believed and came to him to be healed. Let's turn to Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Jesus had just come to Peter's house and his wife's mother was laying there with a fever and he touched her hand and the fever left her and she, she rose up and actually served them. Gave them something to eat. And in 16 we're told, when evening had come, they brought to him, that's Jesus, many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. He healed all. So who's not included in all? Nobody. Nobody. He healed all. Now, who came to him, it says. Let's look at another scripture that it is a sad situation, or was, um, in Mark 6. We'll look at the first six verses. Mark 6. Mark 6. Mm -hmm. So he went out from there, and he came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. Jesus seemed to always be on the move. He was always going around to the people. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. Where did this man get these things? Where did that wisdom come from? And, and such mighty works are performed by his hand. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. This is his hometown. These are people that knew him. What do you believe from our other scripture happened with these people, these few people that he did heal? What, what could we conclude from our first scripture in Matthew? They came to him and they believed, yes. No, yeah. The right. They remembered him like he was uh, as a little boy. I, this question is, is in our message for today because it's good for us to just remind ourselves that Jesus Christ never said no to anybody who asked him to heal them. Isn't that something? Never said no. They came to him and they believed. We're going to read a strange story uh, today about four men who stepped out. The fifth man would have stepped out, but he wasn't able. But he allowed them to be his feet. And these four men actually stepped out for him or on his behalf. This is an interesting story because <clears throat> we read it on the surface and we say, well, that's an interesting story. But today, God's going to have us look underneath that simple story on the surface. Look underneath it and see what was really going on. We had a good friend in, uh, when we lived in Kentucky and he and his father owned a, a Ford uh, uh, sales 
um, company there, sold uh, Lincolns and Fords. Anyway, <clears throat> I remember him telling me how he, he just got a kick out of it that anytime somebody would come to buy a car, he said almost invariably, the, you know what the first thing they wanted to do? They wanted to lift the hood and look underneath and, and look at the motor. And his name was Wally. And I remember him saying, Gary, they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue what's under that hood, but they think that when you buy a new car, you're supposed to lift the hood up and look underneath there. So that's what they do, you know. Well, today, uh, we're going to lift the hood up on this story. We're going to look under it, at, except we're not going to be clueless. Uh, the scriptures help us understand what was really going on, and that's the lesson that we want to see today. So it's in Mark 2, if we go back to Mark, the first few verses. Why don't we just read the story, and then we'll uh, cover the points that I have in my notes that are in your bulletin. <clears throat> 2, verse, starting in verse 1 of Mark 2. And again... He entered Capernaum after some days. You remember the, the map that I gave you? Capernaum is in the um, upper left-hand corner. If you remember, the Sea of Galilee kind of looks like this. And Capernaum is right up there. Often, Jesus was over here. And so this trip from, Caper uh, from over here to Capernaum... They apparently they made it quite often, um, and that was the time that Peter walked on the water. Remember when we had that message uh, about Peter stepping out? Well, <clears throat> we're told in here in uh, verse one, he again entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Some translations say his house. Most scholars have concluded that Jesus, because of some other scriptures, didn't own the house, but that it was probably a house that he was given to use or allowed to use by some family there in Capernaum. But what happened was, every time he went home, <laughs> look at verse 2, immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them. In other words, they filled the house up. And the rest of it says, not even near the door. So they not only filled the house up, but they spilled out into the, the surrounding area around the house. And there, and there was such a multitude of people there that you, you just couldn't get in. Couldn't get into the house. <clears throat> and what was he doing there? In verse 2. Preaching the Word. Jesus was constantly speaking the Word of God. Speaking about the Kingdom. And people came from miles and miles to hear. But they also came for another reason. And verse 3 will begin this interesting story. Then they came to Him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. I'm going to read the whole thing and then we'll comment on it. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their heart, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned this within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, paralytic my tongue won't work that fast this morning for some reason, Say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he turned and he said to the paralytic, 
I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up, took the bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Today, it'd be hard for this to happen. You try to break through the roof on one of the houses today. And once you get through the roof, you have to go on down the attic and you have to break through the ceiling and then, you know, right on down. But back then, most of these homes had flat roofs and most of them, the roofs were built by poles being stretched or laid across the top of the house. So it was flat. And then some, they would fill that in with either straw, uh, mud. Uh, sometimes they even had stone laying on there that formed the base of the roof. And then they would fit the straw and the mud into it. Often, because it was a cool place to be in the evening, they would actually build a set of stairs up the outside of the, the house so that the, the owners could go up there and enjoy the evening. That's probably what this, how this house was built. But what happened was four men carrying uh, the bed, what, whatever type of bed it was, of this paralytic, and they brought him to Jesus. And they brought him specifically for what reason? We'll see. We will see. That was a trick question. We will see. That is what happened. He was healed. And they did bring him and, and let him down. But we're going to look under the hood and we're going to see what was really going on with this man and these four. Um, you know, I read, I've never been over there, but I did a little bit of reading about that city and, and that area. And it's very hilly, rocky. Uh, the paths or the streets or the walkways are very up and down and, and rough. And so this was quite an effort for these four men to pick up the bed or the pallet that this person who was paralyzed was on to pick that up and, and bring it to that house. That was quite an effort on their part. When they got there, they couldn't even get close to the house. They certainly couldn't get close to Jesus. If you read this story in Matthew, his account, you'll find that inside of that house were the religious leaders. The scribes, it says, were in that house. And they were sitting there. And those are the people that Jesus... Uh, uh, saw them reasoning in their hearts. They were the leaders. So they had come to hear him preach. The people had come, as you said, many of them to be healed. Okay, But this paralytic came for also another reason. Okay, Well, they went up on the roof and they must have taken a pretty good section of the roof out in order to be able to let this guy down along with his bed. I don't know whether they had ropes. I don't, we, don't, we don't know exactly. But we know they tore the roof off. Now, we don't have any evidence of anybody who was in the house or outside going, what are you guys doing? There, there seems to be no surprise. And Jesus didn't, we're not, we don't see that he stepped back and goes, my house, you know, <laughs> you're tearing the, the hole in the roof because you know it was falling down on the people as they tore it off. You know it had to be. So this is a very unusual situation as they did this. But we find out that those who were sitting there reasoned in their heart because the minute this man was let down through the roof, Jesus did not say, be healed in the name of Jesus, or whatever he might say. That isn't the first thing he said to this man. The first thing he said to him was, verse 5, Son, 
your sins are forgiven. Isn't it interesting? That's the first thing he said. Now, <clears throat> there's a little bit of history that goes along with, uh, with some Jewish thought that we want to take a look at. I think it's in uh, John 9. Let's, let's turn over to John 9. And let's start with verse 1. 9. Verse 1, Jesus was passing by. He saw a man that was blind. He'd been blind since birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, it was common among the Jews that if you had a physical ailment, if you, if you were paralyzed or if you were blind, it was a result of sin in your life or your parents' life. That was the belief. In this case, Jesus answered these people in John 9, and he said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Then Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day, because the night's coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in this world, I am the light of the world. And this is the story where he spat on the ground, you know, made the mud, put it on the guy's eyes, and he told him, uh, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed and he came back seeing. Okay, so Jesus states here that just because somebody's ill or they've got some kind of physical uh, problem, it's not beca always because of their sin. So this man comes through the roof by four friends. And the first thing Jesus said is, Son, your sins are forgiven. I want to propose to you that because he probably lived in Capernaum, where the house was, it probably didn't take him uh, very far to get to that house because Jesus told him later, he said, you pick up your bed and you go home. Well, it must have been fairly close. So this man more than likely knew about Jesus. This man more than likely may have even heard Jesus teach. This man more than likely, very much more than likely, was into sin of some kind. This man probably was convicted in his heart about that sin. Because, stop and think about this. That crowd didn't stay there forever. There would come a time when those guys could have brought this paralytic and, and just put him in front of Jesus. Or they could have found Jesus as he walked and put him in front of him. But there was something that was pressing, that was important, that caused them to not wait, to go up on the roof and to rip the roof off to let this guy down to Jesus. And I'm proposing that when you lift it up and you look under the hood, you see that there was a conviction in this man about his sin. His four friends knew about it, but they knew that he wanted to get to Jesus to be healed. But also because of his sin. And so you see Jesus, the very first time he lays eyes on this man, he, he says, your sins are forgiven, not your healed. Now this started a conversation in people's hearts. Not, they weren't saying it, they were contemplating it. They were thinking about it in their heart. And they were criticizing Jesus when he said, your sins are forgiven. Isn't it interesting? They weren't prepared to criticize him for healing the man. They were criticizing Jesus because he said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus used this situation to ask them a question. And he asked them, "Why do you, in verse 8, why do you reason about these things in your heart? 
Do you think Jesus knew the answer to that question? Sure He did. Do you think when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they sinned and God came to them, and, he said, and, and we're told in Genesis that God said, Adam, where are you? Do you think God didn't know where He was? Sure He knew where He was. Why did He have Adam answer? Because He was using that situation to teach Adam and to make a point. Jesus asked them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Because He wanted them to have to answer that question. And the answer was, we don't believe you're the Son of God. The answer was, you're blaspheming. You're, you're, you're saying you're, the, you're uh, God. And only God can forgive sins. He knew that. And so he took advantage of that situation and he asked them a question that made it very difficult for them to come up with an answer this time. And it's in verse 9. Which is easier? Jesus asked him. For me to say your sins are forgiven? Or for me to say take up your bed and walk? Which is easier? And we don't have record here that they started answering his question. You know, he had them between a rock and a hard place there. What he had done, he'd opened up their heart. He had looked under the hood. He knew what was in there. He knew what the engine was, was all about. And he was, he was bringing that heart to light out of the darkness. And they didn't answer him. So he said, just so you know that I have power on earth to forgive sins, he turned to the man and he goes, take up your bed and go to your house. <clears throat> and about two hours later, the man was finally, after struggling, able to get up off his bed and go to his house. Right? No. No. Verse 12 starts with the word immediately. Immediately. Can you imagine Jesus says, take up your bed and go home. And the man gets up. And he had just come down through a roof <laughs> because he couldn't even walk. And he gets up and he grabs his bed. Can you, can you see the crowd? Jesus says, you take your bed and you go home. It's full. The house is full. There, there's crowds of people all outside. Can you see them all moving? Can, can, can you see the man get up with his bed and, and he's, he's starting to walk? And the crowd's just making room for him? And they're all going, wow, look at that, look at that, look at that. And he goes out and he goes home. See, Jesus used that situation to explain that the way we look at things is usually 180 degrees from the way God looks at things. Because you might conclude today it's easier for God to forgive sins than it is for Jesus or anybody to say if you were totally paralyzed, get up and walk and go home. We would draw that conclusion. But I want to propose this to you, that the most difficult thing was the forgiveness of sins. And the reason it was difficult is because God gave His Son in order to do that. That was much more difficult than for Jesus to say, be healed, get up, and walk, and take your bed. God did what the world would say was the impossible that we've been talking about in these messages. God gave His Son to forgive your sin, your sin, your sin, your sin, my sin, everybody's sin. Gave His Son. And because of that, Jesus could stand there and say, take up your bed, go home. And the man walked. And what comes from this? Verse 12, 
in the presence of all of them, they all were amazed and glorified God. Uh, it gave God the glory, you see. <clears throat> now, there's some lessons here for us in this story. And this is about us stepping out. And we want to look at these lessons. First, some people need help coming to Jesus. As a matter of fact, just about all of us needed some help. Now, sometimes God just moves on people. Holy Spirit just moves on people and they just accept Jesus. But a lot of times, those people out there that don't know Him, they need help to come to Jesus. Okay? Will we pick up these people, maybe not their bed, but do whatever we can, be as creative as we can be, as God gives us the mind to think, and, and bring these people to Jesus. And you say, well, I can't do that. I'm not a pastor. Well, I can't do that. I don't know the Scriptures. Well, I'd take it these men probably didn't either, and they weren't pastors either. They were just friends. They were just people who knew he needed to come to Jesus, and that's where they brought him. And I'm telling you, we can bring people to Jesus without feeling like we have to be a scribe, a leader, a pastor. The Holy Spirit will give us what to say and what to do to bring somebody to Jesus. <clears throat> I don't know how, how many experiences you've had with helping people come to Jesus, but some of them uh, you don't have to say very much. <laughs> Some of them, you just ask a question. Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So, sometimes that's all it takes. Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And off they go. No, I haven't, but oh, I've been, and it's really bothered me. You know, and, and all of a sudden, they're ready. And then you're standing there and you go... <laughs> What do I do now? <laughs> what do I do? This guy just said he wanted to come to Jesus, you know? You know? You can pray with him. You can tell him to ask for Jesus to come into his heart. You can tell him to repent of his sins. And you can pray with him. And now you, you might be saying, well, what, what are the things you say? You know, it's kind of like the marriage ceremony. You know, dearly beloved, we're gathered here together. Well, you know how all that goes. Well, it there isn't a thing you say necessarily, but there are just those. I accept Jesus. I repent of my sin. I I want Jesus to come into my heart. I want to live for Jesus. You know, something that simple. I believe God's going to in this church is going to give us individually and this church more and more opportunities to help carry people to Jesus. That's what this church was all about when God came into our hearts to begin with. He said this church is to bring people to Jesus. And you remember the day we listed all the stuff that's happened in two years and we listed the people? <laughs> that's just puts goosebumps on my arms when I think about that. What, what God did. It wasn't us. It wasn't us. It was God. But we were willing. Second point lesson for us. And this is the one that stops more people from helping somebody come to Jesus than anything else, I believe. What I've witnessed, what I've observed... Crowds and religious leaders may not easily yield and allow. They'll try to stop it. And I listed some things here that I've noticed that can do this. And one is tradition. Tradition in churches. Tradition in families. I'll tell you a quick story about a tradition. 
When I was pastoring in Tullahoma, Tennessee, it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. I think it was. Tina might remember exactly. The phone rang. I picked it up, and it was a woman in our church, a member of our that she'd been attending church, and she was crying. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, oh, I want to accept Jesus. She'd been hearing our messages and coming to Bible studies. I want to accept Jesus. And I said, okay. And she said, now. <laughs> right now. And I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what. How long will it take you to get to the church building? Because we had a baptistry in the church building and we also, you know, had some elders that I could call. She said, I could be there in 10 minutes. And I said, okay, we'll meet you there. So I called two of our elders and they showed up. And there she was, she got out of her car, she was crying. And I was preparing to... Uh, help her speak her belief in Jesus, speak that she repented of her sins, speak that she wanted Christ to come into her heart, speak that she wanted to be baptized. <clears throat> and one of the elders put his hand on my shoulder and he goes, hang on a minute, Gary. Just hold on. And I didn't know what he was going to say. And he goes, we can't do this right now. I said, why not? I'd been there about two years as, as a pastor. And he said, she's got to quit crying. I said, what? What do you mean she's got to quit crying? And he said, she's way too emotional. I don't think she knows what she's doing. I said, are you kidding me? I just, I couldn't believe that. And I said, I don't think we need to wait. And he goes, oh, yes, we do. And he got her against my wishes, opened the back door of his car and put her in the back seat. And he told me, he said, you just stay here and we'll be back when she quits crying. And he took her at 1.30 to whatever it was and drove her around town until he thought that she was unemotional enough to go ahead and accept Jesus. Now, I can tell you, we weren't in that denomination very long, and, 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 and we, we, we left that. I'll tell you, those, those kinds of experiences make you go, what is going on here? You know, well, back, she was still sniffling, but she had quit crying. We went inside, and I, I, I led her through those statements, and we baptized her that night, you know. But I experienced, she experienced this, you know, tradition. It's, it's just a tradition. You can't accept Jesus if you're emotional. My goodness, most people who accept Jesus are emotional. I was. <laughs> That's, it's an emotional time. False teaching is another thing that may stop people from accepting Jesus. The teaching today is, it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what church. doesn't matter what they're teaching. All roads lead to God. I mean, that's, that's the... And the ecumenical movement today, being led by the Catholic Church, is trying to bring the churches back in to this, this one world type of get them ready for this one world religion that's on its way. It'll be here after we're all gone, but it'll be here. False teaching. Hypocrites in the church. I, I don't know how many times I've talked to somebody and their answer is, I'm not going to have anything to do with church. Church is just full of hypocrites. You guys, you, you say you believe one thing and your life is totally opposite. You ever had anybody try to tell you? Now, I can't go to church to a bunch of hypocrites. You know. Well, to the extent that that's true, and the life is not consistent with God or Christ, that's not right. 
and it needs to be corrected if that is in the church. A lot of times churches don't correct any of that. They don't deal with it. And, and so what happens? You have people that won't even accept Christ because of it. Another thing is family. Family sometimes can be so against your faith. And they'll be so against another family member coming to Christ. They'll actually try to stop that from happening. Pardon? Yes. Yes. There are other religions that will kill you if you do. And then the other thing I mentioned here is just power. Um, you know, there, there are people who just want to control everybody and everything. And if you're talking about giving Jesus control of your life, they, they don't like that. Uh, and sometimes it's family. Third point. Religious leaders today are watching and thinking, just like they were back then. And you may say something to somebody about coming to Christ, and they may want to come to Christ, and I, I would hate this, but I know it happens. Religious leader says, you can't do that. You're not a pastor. You don't know the word. How can you bring somebody to Jesus? And, and they try to actually stop that. But they get as close as they can. I made a couple points here. They get as close as they can, and they reason in their hearts about the situation. So you have people saying, I'm not good enough to come to Christ. Once I get my life straightened out, just give me a year. Just give me a year. I'll straighten it out, and then I'll be worthy to come to Jesus. You know, somebody hasn't taught them what salvation really is all about. See, and you may have a chance to share what it's really all about, what God did for you. And then the last point, <clears throat> we can help bring people to Jesus with our faith. Who had more faith? I'm not saying there's an answer to this question. Who had more faith? The four men carrying the paralytic or the paralytic? Who had more faith? Maybe they all had the same amount of faith. But the four men had a lot of faith. Because Jesus said, when, when the man came down through the roof, I, have, I haven't, this faith is, is uh, he, he commended them for their faith. Their faith. It was, it was a collective faith. So a church can have multiple people who are bringing somebody to Jesus. Right? Doesn't always have to be just you do it. We can we can help bring somebody to Jesus. Sometimes, and I've had this happen, somebody will call and say, hey, I'm talking to so-and-so, he wants to accept Jesus, I don't quite know what to say. And they, they, they would call because I'm a pastor and say, would you come over? Would, would you let him talk to you? Would you talk to him? You know, and so we get opportunities, different ones of us, to do that. And we, we need to be watching for those opportunities. <clears throat> I'll end with this little short story uh, about a guy that had a hearing aid. I, I, Tina actually stopped, and I, I was sitting in the car, and I let her out, and she went in for a, a, a doctor's appointment. And I was just sitting there in the parking lot, and I was working on some things. And in my mirror, I, I saw these people come out of the building. And it was... <clears throat> there was a man and then there was another man and his wife and his daughter and they all walked out in the parking lot and I don't mean on the sidewalk they walked out in the middle of the parking lot so they got my attention right away and I'm watching so I roll the window down so I can hear what they're saying <clears throat> and this this man in the middle with his wife and daughter apparently, had just got a new set of hearing aids. And the man who had brought them out, apparently, had 
fit this man with his hearing aids. So they came out in the middle, and the man who had fit him with the hearing aids, he goes, now you stand real still and let me walk around you. And he said, all I want you to do is point to where you think I am. So he starts walking around. And the guy's going, you know, and he's pointing right at him. And, and the man says, isn't it something that your hearing aids, without you even seeing, can tell you where somebody is by just listening to them? So he was sort of teaching him how to do that. And then he started teaching him how to turn his head to get better sounds in one way and another. Anyway, so he was out there training him how to use those hearing aids. <clears throat> and I'm sitting there, and I had been praying about this message, and I thought, what a perfect example about bringing somebody to Jesus, but not just dropping them down and walking away. What a perfect example that we in the church, we have opportunities to not just bring people to Jesus, but we have opportunities to help disciple them, teach them. That's what this guy in the parking lot was doing. He was teaching him how to use his hearing aids. When we bring somebody to Jesus, a church should never just drop them. It should never be, okay, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, you know, raise your hand for Jesus, and then somebody does, and somebody sees them, and then service is over, and you see that person that person's just walking out of the building, and, you know, we have opportunities to disciple people. So we need to be prepared, because God will ask us to do that. That's part of bringing somebody to Jesus. This is a really interesting message today about us stepping out, probably with more than one of us stepping out together to bring somebody to Jesus. This church is going to be asked, already has been asked, to do that. And we need to continue to be willing to do that, just like we have in the past. But I know God's going to bless us with those opportunities. So uh, step out. If you even, in your heart, if the Holy Spirit says this person wants to come to Jesus, what if you're behind them in the grocery line? <laughs> Do you say anything? Do you start a conversation? You sure look nice today, you know, I'm, we're right here in the line together. Do you start a conversation? Uh, your children or just, you know, say something. And then let God bring the conversation around. Or do you say, oh, they might think I'm crazy. Or, oh, they might, they might say something negative about me, you know. Uh, so step out. Step out in faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit tell you what to say. If you need help, you call people to help. So let's ask God's blessing on this message today. Father, you have shown us what's really underneath these four men who brought someone to Jesus. Lord, you've shown us that it wasn't just his illness, but it was his sin. Lord, you can forgive sin and you can also heal. And so when somebody needs to come to Jesus, Lord, if there's sin there, obviously, help us to, uh, to pray with them, to bring that sin to you and to let you heal them. If there's physical needs there, let us pray with them, God, and give us the words. But also if there's sin connected with that, show us that, Lord so that we can bring people to you. And then help us to disciple them, God. Give us these opportunities. We are ready and willing as a church to do that. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.